Ron Garrett. Thanks. Um, can I take a quick poll before I start? How many Lisp programmers we have in the room? OK, so fairly a somewhat sympathetic audience. Um, this talk grew out of um, a, a little rant that I wrote uh, that was originally entitled or subtitled The Rise and Fall of Lisp at JPL. And this presentation was originally given at a Lisp users group meeting, so uh, it was very uh, heavily slanted towards that topic. Um, for, for this talk, I tried to uh, de-emphasize that a little bit, make it a little less geeky, a little more general interest. Uh, and as a result, it's come out a little uh, disjointed, um, not quite as coherent as, uh, as it originally was. <clears throat> I'm going to try to sort of dynamically adjust to the interests of the audience. I wasn't quite sure exactly who was going to show up for this. And uh, uh, because of that, so please feel free to interrupt me with questions at any time if I blast over something that you'd like to hear more about. Um, so there are a couple of themes that are going to run through this talk. Uh, of course, that autonomous control of unmanned spacecraft, which is what the remote agent was about. And uh, uh, undergirding that is some lessons learned about uh, software development methodology and the limits of static analysis, and in general, the limits of um, writing software that is mission critical and really needs to be reliable. We learned some very interesting lessons about that. And we also learned some very interesting lessons about affecting change in large organizations. Uh, and uh, a few parenthetical comments about LISP are still remaining. Um, to sort of set the tone for this, there, I, I was uh, uh, doing a little research the other night and came across this quote from Machiavelli, which is often uh, cited on the internet, which is that there, there is nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things. And usually the quote ends there, but if you actually go and look at the original source, Machiavelli goes on and explains why this is. For the innovator has for enemies all those who have done well under the old conditions and only lukewarm defenders in those who may do well under the new. Um, it is only in retrospect that I fully appreciate the wisdom in these words. I'll leave it at that for now. Oops. So let me uh, uh, start the story by taking you back to 1994, where, to paraphrase Bill Clinton, the era of big spacecraft at NASA was coming, drawing to a close. Um, these are the last two large interplanetary spacecraft built by NASA's Cassini, uh, on the right and Galileo uh, on the left, the, the black one. <clears throat> um, you can see, uh, I don't have a laser pointer with me, but down in the, in the lower right-hand corner of the, the Galileo uh, picture and down in the, oh, actually lower right-hand corner of both pictures, uh, you'll see some people for scale. You can see they're, they're the, the size of, of multi-story buildings. They weigh about two and a half tons each. The, uh, Galileo spacecraft is notorious for having its high gain antenna stick. Uh, and uh, one of the things that's not much, when they were trying to open it, it stuck and they weren't able to deploy it. And one of the questions that people often ask is, well, why didn't they try closing it again? And, and uh, they, they weren't able to. A lot of people think that it's because the motor that drove the antenna could only run one direction. That turns out not to be true. The motor could actually drive both directions. And during ground testing, you could see the antenna open and close, open and close like an umbrella. And the reason they couldn't close it in flight is because the switch that drove the motor in the opposite direction was not part of the flight hardware, it was part of the test rig. So the, 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 because they figured we're never gonna have to run it backwards once it's launched, we're gonna open it once and then we'll be done. So we don't need the switch, we can save a couple of grams of weight. Um, so the, the, in, in the mid-90s, for reasons that I'll actually get into more at the end of the talk, uh, it was becoming fairly clear that mission, multi-billion dollar missions like this were no longer going to be viable. Uh, Congress was losing its appetite for those kinds of price tags. And so director of NASA at the time, a fellow named Dan Golden, initiated uh, a radical program of change called the New Millennium Program. And the idea was to take an organization that traditionally had been very conservative and very leery of, of 
novelty and innovation and new technology uh, and try to drag its kicking and screaming into the latter half of the 20th century and uh, try to uh, uh, reduce the cost of emissions by taking advantage of new technologies and economies of scale. The slogan for this program was better, faster, cheaper, to which the, the snide response from the engineering community was, yeah, pick any two. <laughs> um, but uh, Golden was very uh, charismatic and persuasive and uh, got this program off the ground. The first of what was originally intended to be a long series of missions uh, that we're going to test out and demonstrate uh, all these new technologies was this mission here called uh, DS-1. The New Millennium missions were originally divided up into the, the Deep Space or DS series and the Earth Orbiting or EO series. There have, uh, <clears throat> so this is, this is DS-1, the very first New Millennium mission. It's interesting because, uh, for a number of reasons, but the, the most visually apparent feature of the spacecraft is that it has these huge solar panels uh, going off the other side. And then on the, the business end, it has an ion propulsion system. Um, just another drawing of the main bus of the spacecraft with the, uh, the solar panels folded up in the launch configuration. Um, I won't get too much into the details here except to uh, point out this gadget in the Uh, the mouse. Oh, yes. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, this little gadget here, uh, the sun sensor. Um, it, it is exactly uh, what the name implies it to be. It's a gadget that tells you where the sun is. And the reason that's important is because one of the crucial things about operating a spacecraft is that you have to know its orientation so that it can point its antenna towards Earth so that you can communicate with it. And in order for it to figure out what orientation it's in, the easiest way to do that is to look for the sun, which is the brightest, obviously the brightest thing in the sky. <clears throat> that will turn out to be important later. <laughs> uh, here are some, uh, some pictures of uh, DS-1 in flight. The top picture, this one here, this is a, a painting, but the other two are photographs. And this one in particular is interesting because it's a photograph of the spacecraft in a vacuum test chamber with the ion propulsion system actually firing. And this is really what it looks like. It's got this cool blue glow that comes out at the end. The way this gadget works is it takes, uh, uh, let me back up a step and talk about how normal chemical propulsion systems work by essentially burning uh, two chemicals and, and shooting the, the results of that reaction out of a nozzle. And the characteristic of that kind of propulsion is that you're using the same material both for the source of energy and for the reaction mass. In an ion propulsion system, you have a different source of energy from the reaction mass. The reaction mass is a tank of xenon gas, which is ionized and then sent in between two charged plates. And the energy is provided by electrical energy that's generated by these solar panels. And uh, the uh, it, it provides very low thrust, but it, you can run it for very long periods of time. And over time, it turns out that ion drives are much more efficient than chemical propulsion. But for you fans of Star Trek out there, there's a very famous Star Trek episode where they, they chase an alien spacecraft by following the trail of ions from its, from its, its ion drive. It really is a real, a real thing, and this is what it looks like. This is a, a closer view of, of just the ion drive unit itself in a vacuum test chamber. This is, a, again, a photograph. And I actually had the good fortune of being able to see this thing in the test chamber with my own eyes. This is exactly what it looks like with, this, with, cool, with the cool blue glow and everything. It's the xenon. That's the xenon ions coming out the back end. So the, this thing here is is basically a, just a screen like you'd find on a screen door. And there's another screen behind it. The spacing between them is, I think, a couple of millimeters. I'm not sure about that. Um, and you just put an electrical charge between them. And then you ionize these, the xenon gas and run it through these screens. And the electrical, the difference in the electrical potential accelerates the xenon, pops out the, the side of the screen going very fast, and Newton then 
arranges for the, the spacecraft to go the other direction. Um, this is a, a photograph of the actual spacecraft with, again, people for scale. And uh, notice how much smaller the spacecraft is compared to uh, Galileo and, and Cassini. Um, in, in terms of numbers, the contrast between the uh, DS-1 and its predecessors was really striking. Galileo uh, was 10 years, approximately 10 years from inception to launch. The reason I say approximately is because it was originally scheduled to launch in 86, but that was delayed for three years because of the Challenger disaster. And there's actually some speculation that that delay is what led to the antenna sticking because in those intervening three years, the, uh, the lubricants on the antenna dried up and evaporated. Weighed two and a half tons and cost $1.7 billion. Uh, Cassini was 15 years from inception to launch, weighed about the same as Galileo and cost $3.2 billion. And by way of contrast, DS-1 was four years from inception to launch, or about a quarter of, the, of Cassini's schedule. Weighed 373 kilograms, which is about 15% of Cassini's mass. And this was the real killer. Had a $100 million budget, about 3% of the predecessor missions. We, we overran that by 50%. <clears throat> <laughs> but uh, still, by, by NASA standards, this was a dirt cheap mission. Uh, this is a short, incomplete list of some of the technologies that were aboard. There's, of course, the, the solar electric propulsion and the, uh, the, the solar array. I used to know SCARLET was an acronym that stands for Solar Concentrating Array of something uh, I can't remember now. There was also uh, something called AutoNav, which was a navigation system to let the spacecraft figure out where it was by taking images of near-Earth asteroids and triangulating its positions by looking at the apparent position of these asteroids against the star field. And a couple of other things, a small deep space transponder, monitor, and a couple of science instruments, and of course, the remote agent. Um, the mission actually produced some science return. We, uh, we went to a comet and an asteroid. Uh, the comet was called Borelli, and the asteroid was called Braille. And this image uh, of Borelli is the image from closest approach to still today the uh, uh, clearest image of the nucleus of a comet that has been uh, produced to date. And you may notice that the image of Braille is not quite so clear. And there's a story behind that, too, which I'll get to in a little while. Hmm? Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's ironic. I guess the irony of that name didn't strike me until now, but yes, you're right. <laughs> uh, so the remote agent was a system for controlling a spacecraft autonomously without uh, human supervision. And the intended benefit of that was to reduce operations cost. If you looked at the, the total mission cost, the operations cost were a significant fraction of the total overall mission cost. And the goal of the New Millennium program was to make uh, flying missions better, faster, and cheaper. Uh, and so one of the ways of reducing the cost was to not have to have as many operators on the ground telling the spacecraft exactly what to do. There were three major components of the remote agent. There was a, a planner called Europa that was uh, developed by this gentleman over here, um, an executive an execu a smart execution engine, um, which was just called exec, that I was a lead on, and a diagnostic system or a, a state modeler called Livingstone um, that uh, was, was worked on by uh, Pandu Nayak, who's sitting over here. Um, and uh, as long as I'm at it, I'll also uh, uh, mention Jim Larson, who is over here, who also worked on the room agent. So there are at least three people, in, uh, in addition to me in the room, who worked on this project. And uh, they're here to keep me honest. And as long as I've mentioned that, I should also say that I've been challenged on my figure on how far away the spacecraft was when the story I'm about to tell you unfolded. The, my recollection was that it was 45 minute light trip, round trip light time away. Uh, and when you back solve that, <clears throat> it turns out to be 250 million miles. 
But Nicola here says that no, it was only 45 million miles, so it's possible that I'm, I, I'm off. Or it might have been kilometers, and NASA has a track record of, of <laughs> mixing those two up. <laughs> Um, so it, it was possible that that number is a little off. After the, the talk, I'm going to try to look it up and see if I can pin it down one way or the other. Um, but it was still pretty freaking far away. <laughs> uh, so the way that uh, remote agent was, was organized was conceptually very straightforward. Um, you had goals coming in from the ground telling the spacecraft what you wanted it to do. And the planner came up with a plan, which was... Uh, given to the executive, which then executed it and took care of handling unexpected contingencies, like hardware breaking. And there is a, uh, a tight feedback loop between the spacecraft hardware and sensor readings coming back to uh, the monitoring system so that when you see a sensory anomaly, you can back solve through a model of what the spacecraft configuration is to try to figure out what actually went wrong and how to deal with it. Conceptually fairly straightforward, uh, but the uh, actual implementation details certainly back in the day were fairly challenging. The remote agent was written in Lisp. There, I said it. Uh, I don't know how that decision is viewed uh, today, and I certainly don't know how the people in this audience think about it. I think that in the programming world at large, Lisp is now mostly seen as kind of an obscure, niche language that a few AI geeks maybe use, um, but it's not something that uh, is, is commonly used by hackers today. Uh, and, and so it's not, certainly not the, the first thing that comes to mind or that would come to mind if you were going to do this today. But you have to keep in mind that this was the mid-90s. The state-of-the-art spacecraft software uh, was still being written in assembler language in some cases. And uh, in the case of Galileo and Cassini, the flight software for those spacecraft were, were uh, written in HAL S and ADA, respectively. It's a programming language that... <laughs> I don't know anything more about it other than that it was used to write the flight software uh, for, uh, uh, for Galileo, and, and as far as I know, hasn't been heard from since. <laughs> um, there was no Python. Uh, Java, there was no uh, Java. Uh, ANSI C was five years old, which is new by spacecraft standards. Um, and C++ was, had been around for longer, but it still wasn't ready for prime time about which more will be said later. Um, also, at the time, uh, there was still a vibrant LISP development community at NASA. There was a lot of LISP work that had been done up to that point. Uh, there was a lot of work done on autonomous rovers that, that work led to the Pathfinder missions. Nearly all of that work was done in LISP, although Pathfinder itself was programmed in C. There was something called the Spacecraft Health Automated Breezing Prototype, which was a ground-based diagnostic system similar to the Livingstone system that flew on the remote agent. Um, and a whole bunch of other things. There was a spacecraft sequence generator called Planet 2. There was a software patch uh, generated for the Galileo magnetometer um, that was all... Uh, the, the code for the magnetometer was written in fourth. And they had a memory byte go bad in the middle of its two kilobyte bank of, of program, of code space. And so they had to figure out a way to recode things uh, to work around this bad byte of memory. And the original development system for this instrument had run on an Apple II, which had long since been decommissioned. And so the way we fixed that problem was basically recreating the entire fourth development system in Lisp so that it could run on a Macintosh. And uh, that makes another interesting story, um, but for another time. Um, and some other things. So the use of Lisp at the time uh, was controversial, but not completely outrageous. Uh, not quite as crazy as it would sound, probably sound today. Now there was a fourth component 
of the remote agent, which turned out to be sort of the, the remote agent's bastard stepchild. Um, and I don't mean that to sound as disparaging as it came out, <laughs> um, especially Reed Simmons, if you are listening to this or ever see this on YouTube. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to present this story as objectively, uh, this part of the story as objectively and as, as soberly as I can. Um, if I fail, I apologize. There was quite a bit of emotion associated with this in the day and some of that is hard to let go of. So TCA is, was another autonomous control architecture. TCA stands for Task Control Architecture. It was developed at Carnegie Mellon University uh, by a, a fellow named Reed Simmons and it had two major components. There was uh, something called TDL or Task Description Language, which was a language for describing, uh, uh, giving instructions to a robot to be executed by a smart executive that could deal with contingencies. And there was also an IPC, an interprocess communication component that had nothing to do with autonomy or, or intelligence or anything even really interesting from, from a research or even a technological point of view. But they built it because at CMU, they were running this code on multiple processors and they needed some way of doing interprocess communication. And there was nothing available off the shelf at the time. And so they had to roll their own. So the IPC was something that uh, basically filled the same niche as Google protocol buffers do today. But of course we didn't have those back in 94. Or, or we might have used them. Now there was quite a debate early on about what components were going to go into the remote agent. And we were given marching orders that Carnegie Mellon had to have a role of some sort in the development. And so in, in the course of the, uh, uh, the resulting design discussions, there was a conflict between TDL, the task description language developed at CMU and exec, the executive, which also had a competing language that it was written in called ESL or execution support language. Um, and uh, we couldn't use both. They filled the same role. We had to choose one or the other. And the politics, it, there was a lot of emphasis on trying to spread the work around as many different NASA centers as possible in the hopes of getting as many different centers on board with the whole program of inducing major change at NASA. It was believed, and probably rightly uh, in retrospect, that if any major player was shut out, that they would oppose the entire new millennium program and that that opposition would result in the program failing. And that was very likely true. So TDL and ESL were competing um, and IPC was competing with something else that was available at the time called CORBA, which is called the, the Common uh, Object Request Brokering Architect Architecture. Does anybody here know, remember CORBA? Oh, wow, it's, I'm shocked. Uh, does anybody actually use CORBA anymore? Oh, okay, that's, uh, <laughs> my world, so my worldview is not rock. Uh, one of the things that I remember most uh, from my days at Google back in the early days was reading the, uh, the, the guidelines for interviewing new job candidates. And it had some things to look for as sort of yellow, uh, yellow flags. And it said, you should ask them, how would you do this and this and this and this? And if they mentioned the word CORBA, don't hire them. <laughs> um, and that was one of the reasons I, I knew I'd come to work at the right place. CORBA didn't have an advocate at the proceedings and IPC was competing with it. And so sort of by default, we ended up with an architecture that looked like this, where we had the planner and the executive and the monitoring system that were all written in Lisp and running in the same Lisp process, but were forced to communicate with each other through this interprocess communication system that was written in C and was buggy and crash prone because it would have been developed at a university by students um, and was designed to run on 
research rovers where if something went wrong, you could just reboot them. And unfortunately, that wasn't the end of our problems. Um, because our inner process communication system was written in a language other than what the application code was written in, we had to have the data be marshaled, serialized, and deserialized in order to communicate between the two languages. Now, I, the TCA IPC supported that, but it had its own data description language. Um, and it had to be kept, the, the, the data structure descriptions in the data description language had to be kept manually in sync with the .h files for the C code in the main lines, in the spacecraft control code that we were communicating with. So we now had three different descriptions of data structures that had to be kept manually in sync. We had the, uh, uh, the TCA IPC code, we had the .h files for the C code that was in the spacecraft control code, and we had the list data structures in the RA. And of course, keeping those in sync manually uh, was a horrible mess. And so a, a fellow named Bob Konevsky built a tool that uh, tried to parse the .h files and generate, uh, automatically generate the DDL and the list data descriptions. This tool uh, was also an acronym that I can't remember what it, what it stood for, but it, it had the also unfortunately ironic name of CLASH. And because Clash was a hastily developed one-off tool, uh, it also had lots of bugs and problems. Um, and so we now had two different external tools that were injected into this very highly accelerated development process for a spacecraft control system that had never flown before. Yeah? The protocol buffers solved this problem. <laughs> Uh, they pr so I actually don't know enough about the, the, the question was would protocol buffers have solved this problem <laughs> Jim says if they'd been invented at CMU they would have um, they, 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 they certainly if we had had access to protocol buffers as they exist today it certainly would have helped because protocol buffers are in use in a production system and hence more reliable than the IPC system was when we started using it because it came from a university research project. So in that particular, in that respect, it would have helped. I don't know enough. I've never actually used protocol buffers myself. I just did a little bit of, of look up the name last night. Uh, I, I understand that they have bindings to lots of languages. Um, and so I suspect that that also would have helped a lot. And just the fact that it's designed in a way that's specifically intended to bind to lots of languages would have helped. So I strongly suspect that the answer is yes. But the only way to know it for sure, of course, is to try it. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so I, 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 uh, it's just been pointed out to me that I got some of my terminology wrong here. It, it, DDL was another part of the system. DDL was the domain description language for the planner. It's a planner, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, uh, data, the, data description, the data description language for the IPC has some other name, and I can't, can't remember what it is. No, but that's true. I mean, if there was a translation between the department which is just the paradigm of a task, right, which could be just a sort of a But that's, Clash didn't handle that. I didn't, no, that's what it was. Yeah. It was, okay. So Some of my memories of this are, are, are fuzzy. Yeah, the part uh, is the constraint part of the DDL. We have this part of that. Okay. Um, in any case, the, the, the details here don't matter much. What, what matters is that the politics of the situation drove the inclusion of this component of the architecture, which drove the development of this tool, which turned out to be difficult to use because it was developed hastily and didn't really have time to mature. Um, and so after 
two years of working on this, we had something that was kind of sort of working, but it was crashing all the time and, and, and the development cycle was very slow. And it was clear that we were splitting our schedule and our budget um, and people were starting to get very tense. Um, and it didn't help that uh, all this AI technology and Lisp and all this weird software sort of stuff was viewed with extreme suspicion by the spacecraft community uh, from, from the get-go. Um, and so in 1996-ish, there was a design review, a critical design review, which is a term of art. Uh, it's a formal part of, of the spacecraft development process. And it consisted of, of about 50 or so so top NASA managers all gathered in a big room very similar to this one and all of the area leads for the mission uh, presenting, uh, giving updates on, on the current state of things. And one of the people who presented was the lead software uh, integration engineer. And his report was that the project was a shambles. Nothing was working, everything was behind. We were, we were heading for a train wreck. And at the end of a half hour long uh, exposition on, on exactly all the, all the different things that were going wrong, one of the managers in the audience finally got fed up and said, okay, if you could do one thing that would help improve the situation, what would it be? And his answer was, get rid of the remote agent. Those weren't his exact words. What he actually said was get rid of Lisp. Um, I'll just leave it, leave it at that. That's what he said. The result was, um, <laughs> that the remote agent got downgraded from the mainline flight software. We were originally going to run the spacecraft for the entire mission. And uh, a couple of weeks after that design review, the decision was made to downgrade us to a flight experiment and to replace the mainline flight software with a port of the software that had uh, run the uh, the Mars uh, the Mars the first Mars rover mission the Sojourner the Pathfinder mission. Um, there was also uh, some attempts on the part of the uh, the remote agent team to address this concern that that Lisp was a source of problems and there was attempt made to rewrite the planner in C++ which also had to be abandoned after a year because it turned out that C++ was not quite ready for prime time. Um, it was, it, the situation there since has, has obviously improved markedly, but back then trying to find a reliable compiler for C++ and in particular a reliable compiler that had a back end for the flight processor turned out to be impossible, didn't exist. But it took us a year to learn that. So all this sets the stage for uh, the story of what actually happened on the mission. And, and to sort of frame this, I'm going to go back over and review the chronology very uh, briefly. So the whole New Millennium program was announced in 94. The critical design review happened about two years later, uh, around 1996. DS-1 was launched two years after that, October 24th, 1998. And it's probably a good thing that we were downgraded because the remote agent software was not ready when the spacecraft launched. It had to be uploaded later uh, in February of 1999. And then in May of 1999, the remote agent experiment actually ran. We controlled the spacecraft for three days. And then in July of 99 and September of 2001, we uh, did our comet and asteroid, uh, sorry, asteroid and comet flybys. And the most salient feature of this chronology is that they actually let us run the remote agent experiment before the science experiments, which in retrospect was an amazing show of confidence on the part of NASA because we could have lost the space, we, the, the, by turning us on, we're in a position that if something went wrong, we could have lost the spacecraft. Um, and the fact that they didn't wait until after the science was in the bag to run us, um, I, I think was, we didn't really, I certainly didn't personally appreciate it at the time. 
Uh, but in retrospect, uh, it was an amazing show of confidence. It is, it, I just point that out to show that NASA as an institution is not always inherently averse to taking risks. So the mission as a whole had lots and lots of issues. It was really a testament on the one hand to NASA's ability to perform under extreme pressure because the mission was not an unmitigated disaster. It, it worked and we got all, all of, we didn't lose the spacecraft and, and we got some science out of it and we demonstrated all of our technologies. Um, but it, it was also a testament to Murphy's Law because lots and lots of things did go wrong. Uh, when the ion engines were first fired up, they powered themselves down after four minutes. Turned out that what had happened was a little grain of sand residue from the chemical propulsion uh, engines that in, uh, injected, the, that, that uh, launched the spacecraft, got stuck in the little screen, uh, in between the two little screens and caused them to, on, on the ion drive and caused them to short out. Um, the mainline software, the, the, the supposedly reliable backup software that was inherited from the Pathfinder program crashed 48 hours before the Braille flyby. Um, this was, of course, after RAX, so RAX has nothing, had nothing to do with that. But that was the reason why the image of Braille uh, was, was so fuzzy. Um, it was a heroic effort to get the spacecraft back in an operational mode in that short amount of time. And the fact that they were able to get a picture of it at all is really amazing. Um, the star tracker, which was the one piece of hardware on the spacecraft, which was not a new technology demonstration. It was supposedly old, reliable hardware, uh, failed shortly after Braille. And again, another heroic effort on the part of the spacecraft team uh, was able to uh, repurpose one of the science instruments in order to um, uh, in order to get the spacecraft back to the point where it could figure out what its orientation was. And then finally, there was what is the, the central topic of this talk, which is the RAX bug. The reliability of all this, uh, the software on the space is extremely important. Um, we're control, going to control uh, an asset that uh, had a $150 million investment behind it, which by NASA standards was dirt cheap, but still seemed like real money to us at the time. And if you screw something up, you can't just go into the machine room and reboot. If the spacecraft loses its sense of orientation, and there are lots of ways that that can happen, and it isn't pointing its antenna to Earth, then you've lost all communications with it. And you can't, and if, if the spacecraft isn't able to, on its own, figure out what's going on and get itself oriented back to Earth, then you've lost it. You've lost this $150 million asset. So RAX, along with all the other flight software, was extensively tested for months. And in addition to that, we actually did a formal proof of correctness of certain aspects of the software. And in particular, the exec was, was, was uh, underwent the static analysis using a tool uh, called SPIN, which does static analysis of, of multi-threaded code and was formally proven to have certain desirable products uh, 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 certain desirable um, features, most notably being free of deadlocks. So we ran for three days in a heavily scripted scenario. So we knew ahead of time exactly what was supposed to happen, despite the fact that the spacecraft was operating autonomously. And on the second, and so for two days, we were listening to telemetry coming back from the spacecraft where it's telling us this happened and this happened and this happened, and everything lining up according to the script. And then on the second day, 48 hours into the experiment, there was an event that, we were, that was supposed to happen that wasn't in the log. And so the red alert was called, all hands on deck. And I got to experience firsthand what it's like to deal with a spacecraft emergency. And it's a very interesting process because you now have this very expensive asset very far away the round trip light time is somewhere between 10 and 45 minutes, depending on who you ask. And so everything that you do has to be thought out very, very carefully. And there is 
this elaborate procedure and protocol for deciding exactly what it is that you're going to do. You start out with the engineers who actually wrote the software all gathered in a room trying to brainstorm, trying to figure out what's going on and what should be the next thing to do. Uh, and, and of course, the first thing we wanted to do was to gather up some more uh, telemetry information to figure out, to, to actually find out what happened. Um, so then that group of people comes up with a proposed plan of action, which then goes through a number of layers of management um, that are progressively further removed from the technical details and therefore progressively less qualified to actually assess whether the plan that's being proposed by the engineers is actually a good plan or not. Um, and then finally, the plan ends up at the console of the person who actually types the commands into the, the terminal that's, that's hooked up to the deep space network that actually communicates with the spacecraft. And everything that, per and that person actually has almost no clue of what's going on because what their job is is to just deal with this interface and they are an expert at the vagaries of the particular UI of this legacy system that was originally developed back in the 50s and 60s. So they're told what to, they're told what to do and they type it in and they do it. <clears throat> and everything that they do is recorded and they have, they're, they're wearing a little microphone and they go through the kind of procedure that you imagine that you see in the movies where uh, somebody says, you know, ready, ready for system upload. Um, and, and somebody else in the room says, Syst you know, go for system upload. And the operator types something. And this is the only person who actually has their hand on the button, so to speak. But, uh, but all, of this, all of this formality is there because if it doesn't work, they want to be able to go back and do a post-mortem post and figure out what went wrong. And that's why they're so anal about recording every little, every single thing that was done and said and every keystroke that was entered. So the problem turned out to be a race condition induced deadlock, um, which we were able to find and fix in large part because we had a read eval print loop on board. And because we had a read eval print loop on board, we could upload code on the fly that for example, that, that did things like look through uh, the, the state of all the semaphores and all the processes and whatnot. And I don't remember exactly how many round trips it took. It was two or three, every one of which went through this long elaborate process before we convinced ourselves that we understood what the problem was um, and decided on a, on a, a plan of action that, uh, that would unlock the deadlock and let the experiment continue, which we eventually did. Eventually, the experiment proceeded, and uh, uh, and everything was hunky dory. And we eventually were were uh, awarded a a prize. We were named NASA Software of the Year for 1999. Um, but this raises an interesting question, which is that how is it possible that a system that was ground tested for months and had a formal proof of correctness that that there could not possibly be, be a deadlock nonetheless have a deadlock in production? And the answer to that turned out to be twofold. The first is that we just got unlucky. In, in the post-mortem analysis, we figured out exactly what happened and it was an event that was very crucially timing related. And the clock on the flight computer was very slightly different than the clock on the bench ground computer that uh, um, that all the tests had been run on. And so the probability of hitting the exact sequence of timing that would lead to this deadlock turned out to be just very slightly higher on the flight system than on the ground system. And we got unlucky. Uh, I don't remember what the odds were against us. They were pretty heavily against us, but we, we managed to discover this bug anyway. And it's probably a good thing because we wouldn't have learned this lesson otherwise. It was a very valuable lesson to learn. Because the other thing that happened was that the next question is, well, how is it possible that this situation exists after this formal proof of correctness? So one possibility is that the proof system that was used to prove correctness was actually had a flaw in it. That turned out not to be the case. So something much more prosaic than that. Does anybody care to hazard a guess? 
Yeah. Hmm? Well, yes, yeah, there's obviously some assumption were wrong, was wrong, but which assumption? No. You did what? No, it, it, revision control is not one of our problems. They're very anal about that. They're very careful about making sure that you fly what you test and test what you fly. That's all part of, of this, what we at the time found to be burdensome bureaucracy. The what? No. That's right. The code. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name? Oh, okay. Another. This this is the guy who actually did the analysis. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't recognize you. I don't think we've ever actually met before. Okay. Well, it's great to finally meet you. <laughs> yeah. So 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 the executive was was designed. Uh, as a, a layered system, there was this core kernel that provided all of the core functionality, and that's the part that was analyzed and proven to be deadlock free. And then layered on top of this kernel was the application code. And the assumption was that because the kernel was deadlock free, that the application code would be deadlock free as well. But what happened was that the application engineer who wrote the application code encountered something that he had to make work that he couldn't make work under the constraints that were imposed on him by the design of the kernel. And so he wrote a little bit of code that worked around this problem. And that little bit of code that worked around this problem turned out to be the source of the deadlock. And this is interesting because it, it's, it's a problem that is, I don't see any way to solve this problem. Because even if you have a formal proof of correctness, unless you have a formal proof of correctness of every single line of code in your system, which is certainly impossible given the, the, the current state of the art, and probably impossible in general given the halting problem, um, you're, you're going to have to deal with situations where a coder has done something to work around an issue that inadvertently in all innocence violates one of the rules of the road that you have to obey in order for your proof of correctness to be valid. And I think that that is a very uh, useful lesson for all software engineers to keep in mind, particularly when they have debates about the, the relative merits of static versus latent typing. I won't say anything more about that. <laughs> so uh, the uh, the aftermath um, officially racks, and in fact, the DS the entire DS1 mission was a success. Um, it worked mostly. Uh, we didn't lose the spacecraft, which was a a, a big uh, a big feather in our cap. Um, we flew the very first, but not the last, redevelop print loop. Um, the uh, uh, all the, uh, the Mars rovers have um, used an operating system called VxWorks, which has a rudimentary sort of redevelop print loop. Uh, people here would call it a shell. Um, but uh, it, it's, it, it's interesting because in 2004, the, I forget which rover it was, one of the rovers, it wasn't Sojourner, it was, Peter, do you remember which one? Was it at the deadlock? In any case, the, the exact same problem, was a spirit? Okay. Had almost the exact same problem in code that had absolutely nothing to do with the remote agent, had nothing to do with Lisp. It was just straight up C code written by spacecraft engineers. Um, and it was almost a point for point replay of the RAX deadlock. Code was tested out the wazoo, analyzed out the wazoo, still deadlocked. They were able to save the mission, again, only because they had a REPL on board that they were able to figure out what was going on and, and, and give it a kickstart. Unofficially, though, 
uh, at least from the point of view of most of the people who worked on it, it was a disaster. Um, it was it was not the launching pad to long, successful, glorious careers uh, for at least for, not for anybody on the on the Rax team. Uh, there are some of the spacecraft engineers who who are still working on spacecraft there. Um, and from my personal point of view as an advocate of, of LISP and somebody who believes that uh, you can get a lot of leverage from using that programming language, um, I find it very unfortunate that that was the end of LISP development at JPL and at NASA. No LISP, nothing has been written in LISP at NASA since, as far as I know. Certainly not any flight software. Um, But it was it was a bigger it was an even bigger failure than that. I was having a discussion with Nicola the other day, um, sort of reminiscing about this, and came to the realization that the entire New Millennium program, that whose vision was a future NASA that was flying small, cheap missions in large quantities in order to take advantage of economies of scale, that didn't happen, <clears throat> and. This is the most recent unmanned spacecraft that's under development by NASA today. This is the, Mar the, uh, the Curiosity rover, also known as the Mars Science Laboratory. And notice the, the people over here for scale. This thing is the size of an SUV. It weighs a ton, literally a ton, 995 kilograms. Um, it cost $1.7 billion to develop. And I will personally be surprised if this is not the last unmanned spacecraft that NASA ever flies. Um, NASA is, uh, as an institution, is, um, is, is in decline. Uh, there's a lot of talk about replacing the shuttle and re resurrecting the manned program, um, but obviously uh, not very much actual progress in that regard. Um, so the new millennium program in some sense can be viewed as, as a deep systemic failure of NASA to, in, in this attempt to reinvent itself. And also other attempts that have been made at NASA, for example, the idea of a permanent base on the moon or a manned mission to Mars, all these other big ideas that were supposed to drive change and drive the institution into the 21st century, none of those have come to fruition either. And I think that it's inst instructive to at least speculate about why that is. So I was thinking about this, and here's some of the things that didn't go wrong. There's some obvious candidates here, but uh, we did not lack support from upper management. Um, it's not like we were some young Turks who were just trying to uh, inject change into a large bureaucratic institution from below and got stomped on. That was absolutely not the case. We had support at all levels of NASA management, including the very top. The NASA director was, was the initiator of this thing. Um, and, and again, I point to the fact that they flew us before they did the science experiment as an institutional vote of confidence for, for the technology. So that wasn't it. Uh, we didn't lack technical expertise. We didn't fail because we were idiots or we did something incredibly stupid. We did bump up hard against some of the fundamental limitations, I think, of some of the fundamental limitations of writing very complex mission critical systems under tight budgets and schedules. But the bottom line is it, it basically worked. Um, we did lack spacecraft training. All of us on the remote agent team uh, essentially knew nothing about spacecraft when we started out, but we learned on the job. And, uh, and by the time we were done, um, I wouldn't necessarily say that we were rocket scientists, but, but you know, we, we could hold up our end of a conversation. <clears throat> So, so what did go wrong? And I found that it was very hard. 
I, I think I know what it was, but I found it very hard to characterize and put into words without miscommunicating. So here's the best I could come up with. Or I usually came up with something like what we lacked was political savvy, um, sort of hearkening back to that Machiavelli quote uh, at the beginning of the talk. But that wasn't really it either. It's not that we didn't do the right wheeling and dealing, although if we had done that, things might have turned out differently. But there were people on our team who did have political savvy. Again, we had support at all levels of, of NASA management, which is not to say that there weren't people along the way who, who were opposed to what we were doing. There were. Um, but it's not that the power structure was against us. And it's not that we didn't have people on our side who understood how the power structure worked and, and, and how to manage it. Um, but here's where I think we went wrong. We focused on technology and economics and coolness. We said, all right, NASA has this mission of reducing its costs, which seems like a reasonable goal. And we have a technology that can reduce costs. And oh, by the way, it's a really cool thing. And NASA kind of prides itself on being an institution that does cool things. And we thought that those three things would be enough to propel us to success. And that turned out not to be the case, because we, we, we assumed that our users, and our users ultimately for our system, were the people who operate spacecraft. Our, our tool was a tool that was going to make spacecraft operators more productive, so that you could take a team that before could operate only one or two spacecraft and let them operate 10 or 20. And we assumed that everybody would agree that that was a good thing. And that turns out not to be true. There's one very crucial group of people who did not think this was a good thing, and that was the operators. Because what they wanted was job security. You think about this from the point of view of somebody who's made their career as a spacecraft operator. They have spent decades acquiring very specialized knowledge that's nearly impossible to transfer to any other field. And so to them, we were not a liberator. We were not people who were coming in there to make their jobs easier, we were people coming in there to make their jobs go away. And they pushed back. <clears throat> and so my theory about why NASA is having problems is that they are having the exact same problem as we had, um, that they're failing to understand the needs of their users. Because NASA, everyone thinks NASA is about space exploration, but it isn't. It's never been about space exploration. When it was first initiated, it was all about beating the Russians. And then it sort of morphed into being about a way to um, uh, to route pork into key congressional districts. Um, and so, Ever since the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, the institution has been rudderless. And I think it's, it's not a coincidence that the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991 marked the beginning of the end, if you look back in a retrospect, of NASA's clarity about its role in the world and what it's supposed to do and how it's supposed to do it. Um, and no one has been able to really articulate a clear mission for the institution since then, which is very unfortunate because it's a tremendous national asset. It's, it's, it really is this group of uniquely smart people and physical infrastructure and domain knowledge. And the fact that we as a nation have not been able to figure out a way to make effective use of that asset for the last 20 years, um, I think is really an, an indictment of us as a nation and as citizens. And I promised myself I wasn't going to say anything controversial, and there I've gone and done it. <laughs> so I'll just um, close with this, uh, with this closing thought, that the, that the hardest part of giving the customer what they want is figuring out what it is. And uh, you, can, you can see this lesson again play itself out again, over and over again. Um, the, the most prominent recent example that people cite as Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs' genius was in being able to figure out what it is that people want. And even he uh, wasn't always able 
to figure it out. You, not, not everything that he touched turned to gold. Um, in fact, he had a lot of flops. The Apple III and the Lisa, most notable among them. It took him a while to figure it out too. Uh, but it's an important thing to think about and put effort into and to be aware of. Because if you get it right, you can really win big. That's it. Yeah, question in the back. Where, where is the spacecraft now? I don't know. It's out in, in space somewhere. It's in solar orbit. Uh, but exactly where, I don't know. That there's, um, th there's almost certainly a web page somewhere in, in the NASA website that will give you its current orbit. But it's, uh, the, the mission has come to an end, so they're not communicating with the spacecraft anymore, as far as I know. Um, and so you probably, I don't know. I, I, have to, I would have to look it up. Um, but if you go, if you go, just Google for you know DS1 current location. If it exists, then then uh, then you'll you'll find it that way. And if not, then you can go find what its orbit was when they turned it off, and and you know just run capillary mechanics on it from there to figure out more or less where it is now. <laughs> yeah. So when you're working on a mission critical system, what's the limit to this time off? So for instance, it's surprising that you were able to lift a spacecraft. It was a tough sell. <laughs> Um, how 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 was the line drawn between? Let me back up and try to rephrase this. Given that we were writing mission critical software, and we're bringing in lots and lots of code that had been written by other people for other purposes, how do we draw the line between? How do we decide how much to vet this outside software so that? we would get to the point where we felt confident betting our spacecraft and our career on the reliability of the overall system. Is that a fair restatement? And the answer is that it was done in a very ad hoc manner. Um, the, uh, up until New Millennium, uh, the processes for making those kinds of decisions were very well established. They had evolved over the course of of decades of lessons learned, often by having spacecraft blow up on the launch pad. And New Millennium was an attempt to dislodge all of that sort of in one fell swoop. And so we were kind of making it up as we went along. And what we ended up with was a mishmash of of intuition and experience and empirical testing and formal analysis. Um, and a wing and a prayer to no small extent. Uh, if we'd had more time to work on it, we probably could have come up with something better. But again, you know, inception to launch um, for, for, for this, what was really a radically new thing in terms of architectural design and budget and schedule, uh, that was really tight. And the, the fact that it, that it worked at all in retrospect is miraculous. Yeah, Jim. If, if you had at the beginning understood what you knew how to accomplish, what would you have done? What would have been the value So I think if I were to go back and do this over again, um, what I would have tried to do was not to try to deliver something that the users wanted, but to go and try to win the users over to our side. Try, I would have tried to market them uh, more and make friends with them and, and give them demonstrations and, and kind of hold their hands and show them how this was, would be a path to a better world for them. We didn't do that. Uh, and I, I don't know if we had tried that if it would have worked or not. Uh, 
but but we we didn't really do a lot of outreach and uh, and I think that was that was probably a crucial mistake um, in our defense you know we had a lot of other things on our plate and didn't really realize except in retrospect how important that would turn out to be uh, but that's um, I, so I actually had a backup slide here, uh, which is some advice um, to recognize that if you're trying to innovate, it's always disruptive. And again, and, and go back and reread that Machiavelli quote uh, that that you will you will always if if by definition if you're innovating you're going to be stepping on somebody's toes, and you should find out who that is, and do something about it. Don't just ignore it. Either schmooze them and get them and win them over. Or find a way to to get them out of the way, but but don't just let them sit there and and grumble because uh, they can make you fail. Could, could NASA have been a better institution at the strategic level? Yes, uh, they, they could have been better by, by applying the same heuristic uh, sort of in the large. NASA proceeded on the assumption that its mission was, at least in part, uh, to do scientific exploration of the solar system. And it wasn't, not and isn't, notwithstanding the fact that people say so, and even people who are in positions of, a, of authority say so. Um, th there are lots of things that politicians say that aren't true, and that's one of them. And so uh, I, I think NASA could be better at recognizing that this isn't true, and either working harder to make it true, um, come do a little bit more outreach to its ultimate users, which are the American people. Uh, do a little more more marketing. Now, it's a little bit weird because NASA is constrained by the fact that they're funded with taxpayer dollars in in, in the you know like they can't buy a Super Bowl commercial. Uh, at least I don't think. I think that there's probably some government regulation that says they can't do that. Um, but they could probably do better at convincing the American public that what it does is worthwhile and, and that they're worth, or at least they have something to contribute, even if it isn't exploration of planets, maybe it's something else, but something that the American people could really get behind and get enthusiastic about writing checks for. I haven't really given that a whole lot of thought. Um, if you. Oh, the question was, have I given that, do I have any ideas as to what? Uh, I haven't given that much thought. I could probably, I don't know, if somebody, give me an hour or two, I could probably come up with something. But I mean, it's, I haven't given it a, lo a lot of thought because, uh, because I don't think that my thinking about it is going to help anything. Because I don't think that the problem is a lack of ideas. The problem, I think I'm convinced that there are tons of people out there who are actually much more qualified at coming up with good missions for NASA. Um, the, the, the problem, I think, is that NASA as an institution doesn't recognize this fundamental problem that it doesn't really have a mission and that that's what it needs to be working on. Ah, what would I put on the next spacecraft? Lisp or Python? Oh boy, <laughs> that's a very tough question. I actually do most of my coding nowadays in Python, um, but but every now and then I go back and I write some Lisp, and 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 when I do it, it makes me cry, because <laughs> because I just envision what the world would be like if certain things had gone slightly differently at certain key junctures in history. Um, and there's one particular episode at Google that falls in that category, which I will tell you about after the recording stops. <laughs> um, that uh, that if, if things had gone differently, I think the world would be a better place. 
But you know, you got to you got to play the hand you're dealt. And in today's world, <sighs> software development is much more of a team sport now than it ever was before. And all else being equal, I still prefer Lisp, but all else is not equal. And so if I have to write production code today, I regretfully write it in Python. <laughs> it's up, up, up to you. Yeah. <laughs>